lose five pounds in three days with our new Wonder Diet. Bathe away those extra pounds with Slimex, the miracle new formula. The scientific way to lose those extra inches. Today, men and women everywhere are as busy as beavers getting off a few or a lot of pounds. And everywhere they're making a hopeless hash of it. And gone are the days when amplitude was synonymous with pulchritude. The jolly fat man is all very well, and me. And who ever heard of a fat James Bond? Or a sex symbol with an OS girdle? And so, the unavailing rituals of quack diets, valueless chemicals, boring exercises, and quickly dying faith, culminating in the more determined in a plea for help from her doctor. And the question for us doctors is, do we care, or should we care? Any patient who has braved the rigours of the waiting room and now faces the embarrassment of the questions and the humiliation of examination because she's overweight, deserves our understanding and has earned our expert advice after perhaps years of deception by advertisement and the ill-informed advice and chaff of friends. But much more serious, an overweight person is at considerably greater risk of disease and illness than her skinny sisters. We can concoct a frightening list of only some of the more important illnesses which are commoner in overweight people. Arteriosclerosis, arthritis, diabetes, difficulties of pregnancy, heart troubles, hernia, high blood pressure, inflammation of the gallbladder, kidney diseases, risks during and after operations, varicose veins, and so on. So we are not dealing with an uprush of vanity. We are dealing with a potential killer. All right then, to be overweight is dangerous as well as embarrassing. But you may ask, am I really overweight? Well, there's no doubt in some cases. And indeed, anyone honest with himself will need no doctor to tell him he's overweight. He won't be particularly proud of that or that. And if the ruler can't find both his ribs and his hip bone, he's got more than he needs, or should have. Or look at it this way. Do you weigh more now than you did 20 years ago? If you do, you're overweight. And just because you're 20 years older, you needn't carry more flesh, even if it has sagged a bit here and there. It doesn't matter how little I eat, I still seem to put on weight. I wondered if there was anything the matter with my glands. Here we go. Glands again. If glands were the cause, there'd be other signs of the trouble apart from overweight. And no doctor would miss it. Anyway, it's very rare. So I'm afraid she can't blame her glands. So what are we going to suggest then? What about restricting fluid intake or salt? Well, that's a nice convenient thing for everyone. And some people do get fat because they don't get rid of excess fluid. Well, a few do. But if so, there's something far worse wrong with them than overweight. And that would have to be treated first. There's nothing like that wrong with this patient. She's just overweight. Or you might think a laxative would help. Well, she may or may not be constipated, but we're not going to cure her obesity by curing her constipation. No, you can be pretty sure her trouble is her food. No one's suggesting she's a glutton or that she's greedy, but for her, she eats too much of the wrong things. It's like this. Food is the body's fuel. And we burn it up to give us the energy we need to stay alive and for all our daily activities. Ideally, the energy we take in as food exactly balances the energy we use up. And our weight stays constant. 
But the simple truth is that if we take in more energy than we use, we put on weight. On the other hand, if we take in less energy than we use, we lose weight. And this is the great universal truth about overweight. Now it's all very well to talk about energy when we mean food, but it only makes sense when we can measure the energy content of, say, a slice of bread. To do so, we use a unit called a calorie, with a big C, properly called a kilocalorie. Actually, it's a measure of heat, which is one of the forms energy takes. A cubic foot of ordinary town gas, for example, when burnt, gives up about 125 calories of heat. So the calorie with a big C is our unit for measuring the energy in food. Our slice of bread has an energy equivalent of about 70 such calories. An average man doing a moderate amount of physical work burns about 3,000 calories a day, and an average woman about 2,500 calories. For each of them, the rule applies. Energy in equals energy out for constant weight. If, as can so easily happen, the energy input exceeds the output, the surplus will be laid down as fat. To correct this, we can do one of two things. Either reduce the input or increase the output. Now, if you're a person who likes his food, you'll almost certainly think first of increasing your output and your friends will tell you to take more exercise. So let's get this question of exercise straight. Look at these snacks. They're each worth about 300 calories. Suppose you eat just one of these things in excess of your actual need and you decide to exercise it off. It'll take you two solid hours of fast walking. Or, to put it another way, you'd have to play squash for eight hours to dispose of one good business lunch. So, if you're taking in, say, a thousand calories a day more than you need, and that's by no means unusual, you're not likely to get rid of them by exercise alone. But surely exercise does some good. Ah, yes, but in a rather surprising way. In a normal, reasonably active man, the energy in equals energy out balance is kept right by a small centre in the brain known as the apostat. Normally, the apostat quite simply tells you you've had enough and you stop eating. But two things play havoc with the apostat. The first is inactivity. Today, man is becoming progressively less and less active. And it seems that the less active he is, the less efficient is the apostat at telling him to stop eating. So some exercise is essential to keep the apostat working well. The other thing that knocks the apostat sideways is palatability. Foods got up to look and taste so good that they are irresistible, unless you are very determined. For all the forces of advertising and marketing are aligned against the apostat. Recently in London, some remarkable research has been done on overeating and the part exercise plays. For the experiments, each meal was carefully controlled and measured. Among other things, it was discovered that after a meal, normal healthy people, even when resting, literally waste excess calories by producing heat. If they also took not very vigorous exercise after the meal, the amount of calories thrown away leapt up out of all proportion to the exercise taken. The conclusion must be that not only does a little regular exercise keep the apostat efficient at stopping us eating too much, but it also encourages the body in this remarkable process of wasting unwanted calories in the form of heat. And this is the value of exercising. It means not always taking the lift. It means getting off the bus a stop or two before you need to. It means doing the shopping on foot. 
That's the sort of thing we mean, rather than an exhausting session of vigorous activity once a week. But exercises don't help me. No. Unfortunately, some people are not very good at wasting calories. And for them, there's only one thing to do. Reduce the input. And if we're actually going to lose weight first, we must take in less than we're using up until the excess weight has gone. Now, the food we eat is made up of three main constituents. Proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. Let's look at them. The proteins come mainly in such foods as meat, poultry, fish, eggs, and cheese. The fats, well, obviously in butter, margarine, cooking fats, and the fat on meat. Also, milk contains a good deal of both fat and carbohydrate. And the other carbohydrate-rich foods are legion. Everything made with flour, bread, cakes, biscuits, pastry, spaghetti, thick soups, and so on. Then there are other cereals like rice, oats, sweet corn, and the rest. Also potatoes and all the sugary things. Sugar itself, sweets, chocolate, honey, ordinary jams, and the syrup in tinned fruits, sweetened fruit juices, and so on. Then there are the drinks, a rich source of calories. A typical day's intake of 3,000 calories from the three groups looks like this. And if we're going to lose weight, we have to cut down somewhere, but first a word of warning. We mustn't just cut down the amount we eat indiscriminately. That could mean that we'd go dangerously short of the things that we must have to keep us going, because food not only provides calories, it also provides us with the nutrients our bodies have to have to keep in good repair and to keep them working well. What we have to do is to cut down on foods rich in calories and low in nutrients, continuing to eat those which are rich in nutrients and low in calories. So let's take our typical day's intake of 3,000 calories derived from protein food, fats, and carbohydrates. The protein supplies about 400 calories. And remember, the protein-rich foods also supply a lot of vitamins and minerals as well. The fats give us about a thousand calories. And the carbohydrates, 1,600 calories, more than half the total. And carbohydrate-rich foods on the whole are poor in vitamins and minerals. Now, what about cutting down? We might cut down on the proteins. But even if we cut out half of all proteins, we only save 200 calories, and we run the risk of malnutrition. So what about the fats? Well, if we manage to cut all of them down to a half, we would make a worthwhile saving of 500 calories, but it would be so dull and difficult to digest that nobody would stick it. And that leaves the carbohydrates, and here the prospects are very bright. We can make great savings here without losing any essential nutrients. We can, in fact, cut them right down to only one-eighth, saving 1,400 calories a day. And, oddly enough, you'd find yourself eating no more fat than you did before. 200 calories are provided by this sort of amount of carbohydrate-rich food. But now, another word of warning. It's not wise, whatever else you cut out, to take less than half a pint of milk a day. Also, you'll have noticed that an apple has appeared here, and we've not mentioned fruit and vegetables so far. In fact, a medium-sized apple like this produces about as many calories as a small slice of bread. But even so, you must have a normal amount of fresh fruit, and vegetables as well. Most of them don't produce many calories anyway. So, what does all this amount to? You needn't concern yourself with how much of all these you eat. Unless you're quite irresponsible, you won't overdo them. On the other hand, you must drastically reduce all these things. The starchy and sugary foods. You'll perhaps miss the sugar and bread most at first, but take heart. 
all is not lost. You can get low sugar jams and marmalade containing only half the normal sugar. And non-calorie sugar substitutes are available as sweeteners, but be careful, you can fall into a trap. Glucose, often used as a sugar substitute, or honey too, for that matter, and sorbitol, which diabetics have instead of sugar, produce just as many calories as ordinary sugar. The pack always tells you what you're buying, and if it's saccharin-based, you're all right. It'll not produce calories. You can also ease your lot with starch-reduced products, which contain little more than half the amount of carbohydrate of bread. Put another way, six rolls are in fact better than one slice of bread. And there are crisp breads, similarly starch-reduced. But again, don't be fooled by crisp breads. Unless the pack actually says they are starch-reduced, you might just as well eat bread. Finally, if you can't manage without your breakfast cereal, there is also a starch-reduced form of these. But again, look for the words starch-reduced on the pack. If they're not there, it's no use for slimmers. So that is the advice the doctor should give this patient, summarized like this. Have as much meat, fish, eggs and cheese as you feel like. Take some fresh fruit and plenty of vegetables. Don't go short on milk, butter or margarine. But keep the starches and sugary things right down and make use of the starch reduced products. All the details are on the diet cards he might give her. If she takes his advice, this overweight lady is going to be slim again. That's quite certain. What's more, she'll stay slim as long as she follows the rules. The simple method suggested has many advantages. And no one could say that the meals it allows are dull or not enough. It'll certainly make her slim, and most probably she's going to look younger. As a bonus, she'll be fitter, and what's more, she won't go short of the essential nutrients. Suppose this is her normal intake of foods. If she merely cut her calories by one-third, by cutting everything she ate by one-third, she probably would go short of nutrients, the minerals and vitamins. On the other hand, with most people, when they cut their calories by cutting back only on carbohydrates, they certainly don't go short of the nutrients, and in fact, they often take in more of them. Furthermore, she'll find that she can keep it up forever if necessary. But she is going to need some new, more elegant clothes. A good shopper need not find it any more expensive. In fact, without the fattening luxuries, she may well find she has some of her housekeeping left. And finally, it's a sociable diet. She won't be a faddy guest because it's easy to decline the carbohydrates or only take small portions. And she won't be a trial to the rest of the family at home. And now, in conclusion, a few general points. How often have you heard this? It's only puppy fat, dear. It'll go. Today's puppy fat is tomorrow's middle-aged spread, so get rid of it now. Or what about this? Well, I only want to get a little off here and there, and then I wouldn't mind. But some of us are, unfortunately, assigned thick thighs or heavy bosoms or broad shoulders or something, and we have to learn to live with them. It's fat we can get rid of, and broadly speaking, whatever you've put on, you can take off. But remember this, a gain of only two pounds a year is nearly three stones by the time you're middle-aged. Two pounds a year. That's... 20 excess calories a day. The calories from just one teaspoonful of sugar a day can make you three stones overweight. And if you can't do without a few pints a day, or your two or three gins or whiskies come to that, you'll just have to cut down on carbohydrates somewhere else. And finally, let's get rid of some rubbish. Massage, 
might make you feel better, but it won't make you slim. Dissolving baths are useless. Special starvation diets won't last. Vigorous exercise alone is hopeless. The simple truth is excess weight has two major causes. Eating too much of the wrong things and underactivity. The cure is a permanent restriction on the intake of starches and sugar, the carbohydrates, and a regular but not necessarily excessive amount of exercise. Her rewards will be not only a slimmer, more attractive shape, but also a considerably healthier body and probably a longer life.